ahead and just tell you guys the truth. Um, everybody who usually preaches here uses that little fancy mic, but with the humidity outside, if I put that thing in my hair, they are never going to get that microphone back. So you're going to have to just be okay with my handheld today. Um, I want to tell you a little story. Something happened about a week and a half ago, and it is so stinking funny. And because I have the microphone, you're going to listen to my story because it's great. Um, we, we built, we, no, they built a new Target close to my house. And I needed a can of Rotel, okay? And it was about five o'clock in the afternoon and every mom in this place knows you never go to the grocery store at five o'clock in the afternoon. And I thought, I'll just run into Target and get this one thing. That would be a perfect segue to a miracle message because if you can actually get into Target and just get one thing and get out of there, that's amazing. But I did it, it was awesome. I grabbed the Rotel, I get up to the registers and I'm standing there, I don't have throw pillows in my hand or all the other things that you tend to pick up when you go to Target. And I look to my right, and there is a woman with, um, that's not quite in the self-checkout area, but just kind of standing there, and she has a cart, and in her cart is this little girl, maybe about four years old. Next to her, she's talking to this other woman that has a little boy who's standing on the floor. Now, this little boy is going, Mama, I want these Legos. Mama, I want these Legos. And she looks to him, and she says, No. He proceeds to throw the Legos, throw himself on the ground, and I have never seen anything like this in my life, and starts kicking and screaming. I was waiting for him to foam at the mouth. I didn't know what was going to happen. And he's kicking so hard, he's kicking in a circle. And I'm an avid people watcher, so I'm just like, and there's enough people in line in front of me, so I'm watching the show. And mom just kind of turns her back, and she just keeps talking to this lady. And so the boy gets louder. So mom gets louder. And the boy gets even louder. And mom is now screaming at this woman. And finally, she looks down at him. And she did, I don't think she did the right thing, but she looks at him, and she said, fine, if you'll shut up, you can have the Legos. And he stands up and is like, Okay. And I'm like, oh. Then the coolest thing happened. The little girl in the cart goes, ma'am. <laughs> like, you can't make this stuff up. And I'm still going, ma'am, he needs a spanking. <laughs> and her mom goes, Macy, you can't say that. And the lady in the line over is like, Macy's telling the truth. And everybody's like, uh-huh. So like everybody was like over this. And I was like, this is crazy. So I get my Rotel, I get in the car, I call my best friend. I'm like, the craziest thing happened. I've got to tell you this story. And so I tell her, and so we proceed to talk about what it would have been like if we would have been that little boy with our parents. And we start telling like spanking stories. You know what I'm talking about. I remember one time, it always starts like that. And you're like, I'm lucky to be here. And so she said, do you, can you remember the worst spanking you ever got? I was like, <laughs> yes, yes, I can. And so I proceeded to tell her the story I'm about to tell you. I don't know what I did. I'm sure it wasn't that big of a deal. But my dad said, get in there and bend over the bed, which I don't know how y'all do it. That's how we did it. So he'd come in there. Now, my dad is a very tall man, and he would come in and he'd pull his belt off and catch it in the same hand. The fear of God hits a child when a dad does that. You know? And you're just like, this is how it ends. And so I'm just looking at him. And I don't know that he did this all the time, but this particular moment he said, Amber, do you know why we spank you? He has a belt in his hand and he's look, like, what do you say? Like, what is the answer to get him to just go away? Right? So I'm just like, no, yes, I'm not. Mom, I didn't, uh. Hi, like, I don't know. Yes, maybe. And so he, he looks at me and he said, honey, we don't spank you because we hate you. We spank you because we love you. And then I did the dumbest thing any child in America has ever done in the history of children. I looked back at my dad and I said, well, why don't you give me that belt and let me show you how much I love you? <laughs> And I promise you, oh, I promise you that if it wasn't for the grace of God and my mama being at home that day, I would not be standing here telling this story. Like, y'all would have to hear about it. That's how she died that day. 
she, on her gravestone, here lies a girl who said the dumbest thing, right? So regardless of how you discipline, whether it's spankings, like at our house, we didn't call it spankings, we called it whoopings, okay? So whether you get a spanking or you get a whooping or you get grounded, you know, as we grew up and I have teenagers, they would, much, they would be like, just spank us, just don't take our cell phone. Just don't take the keys. It's like, yeah, we have control, right? So regardless of how you discipline, time out, grounding, whatever, discipline is biblical and it's necessary. Scripture says in Hebrews 12, 10, for the Lord disciplines and corrects those, those who he loves and he punishes every son whom he receives and welcomes to his heart. We have all, everybody in here, has been recipients of discipline somewhere in our life. Sometimes it's because you deserved it, probably most of the time. And then there's been those few times that you were just like caught in the line of fire and you're like, what, how did I get here? What just happened? And you're like, everybody's getting a spanking. It's like, okay, whatever. And then we all can think of some time where we deserved discipline and we didn't get it. How many of you guys can remember a place? I'm not talking about you didn't get busted, like you didn't get caught. I'm talking about you did get caught and you could get a spanking from your parent. You could have got fired from your job. You could have got a ticket. How many of you guys can remember a place where you could have been disciplined and then you didn't? All right. Today we're finishing out Pastor Randy's series on pardon the interruption. My message title is Unmerited Mercy. Mercy is a tough one. People don't always know what that means and they often confuse it with grace. So my first point that I want to give you today is grace is getting something you don't deserve and mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Let me say that one more time. Grace is getting something you don't deserve and mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Max Lucado says, the difference between mercy and grace, mercy gave the prodigal son a second chance. Grace gave him the feast. One of the most amazing narratives in scripture about mercy is a guy by the name of Barabbas. Most people don't even know who that is. They're like, I've never even heard that name. Or if you have, it's been like on a, good, on a Good Friday sermon or an Easter sermon because he's shortly in the story of Jesus's journey to the cross. And when we hear about it, we hear that, you know, he's, he's brought out and we don't like who he is, but then we kind of take our focus off of Barabbas and we look back to Jesus because he died on the cross and it's wonderful. But I think we need to understand a little bit more about who Barabbas was. All four of the gospels give account to who this man was and they call him a condemned murderer, a notorious robber, a rebel, a leader of an insurrection. So like, what does that look like? What a leader of an insurrection? That is equivalent to what we would call a Muslim extremist, an ISIS terrorist. This dude was a bad dude. He killed people. He destroyed him. He would have been the one that would have walked into a subway with a bomb strapped to himself, ready to take people out. He's the one that was driving a flatbed truck in New York last month. Are you following me? This is not a good guy. He was horrible. And scripture says that he was known throughout the land for what he did. And you know, it didn't talk about where he came from or what his upbringing was like, or if he had daddy issues or whatever. It just said he was a bad guy but he was caught. And right before he hits the scene in the scripture that we know of, he's found sitting dejectedly in his filthy cell. I'm sure guarded by Roman soldiers. It doesn't say if he was sympathetic to others around him. It doesn't say if he was remorseful for what he did, but he had to have thought about how excruciatingly painful his execution was about to be. Because you see the Roman soldiers did not hold back. They killed people on crosses all the time and they did it down the roads. So that when you're going down the road and you look around, you know, hey, I don't wanna do something dumb because I don't wanna be there. But he knew what was about to happen to him. He's sitting in this cell. He had to have been thinking about what was coming and all of a sudden, Barabbas' fate was interrupted. We're gonna look at the story through the version of Luke in Luke 23 verses 1 through 25. What you got here is you've got all these religious leaders and the whole assembly, they come before Pilate and they're like, look, 
We need you to do something about Jesus. In verse two, it says, they began to accuse Jesus, asserting, we found this man misleading, perverting our nation and forbidding us to pay taxes to Caesar and claiming that he himself is the Christ. So Pilate asks him, he turns to him, he said, so you're the king of the Jews? Is what they're saying true? This is the coolest part to me. The only time Jesus says anything in the time where they begin to accuse him to when they hang him on the cross that's recorded, he says, it is as you say. Basically saying, you said it. Yeah, it's true. All of a sudden he's saying, yeah. And then he shuts his mouth. Pilate turns in verse four and he says, I find no guilt in this man. But the crowds were insistent on Jesus being murdered. So Pilate does something that I find to be very interesting because obviously Pilate does not think that Jesus is guilty. He keeps saying he's not guilty. So he goes into the prison and he pulls out the worst prisoner they have. He pulls out their Osama bin Laden, if you will. And he drags him and stands him next to Jesus. Now, history, it was custom, he was obligated because of the Passover feast, Pilate was obligated to release a prisoner. So he says, okay, people, here's your options. Here stands Jesus, who I have no idea why he's even here. I don't even know why you guys are upset. And here stands Barabbas. He's the one that killed your kid. Remember that? He's the one that has caused fear in all of you. He's the one that stole from your business. Remember that? He's the one that's causing this whole town problems. And Jesus. So now I'm going to ask you again. Who do you want? And instinctively and unanimously, the crowd screamed, we want Barabbas. We'll take him back. Kill Jesus. And Pilate just is like so blown away. And they're like, what? And he finds out that Jesus was from Galilee. So he's like, okay, okay, hold on. This isn't even my jurisdiction. So he says, we got to get Herod involved. So found out Herod's in Jerusalem, sends Jesus over and Herod's excited. Herod's excited because he's wanted to meet Jesus because he's heard about all these cool tricks Jesus does. And he wants Jesus to perform for him. I'm going to stop right there and I want to address this for a second. I think that's the problem that we have in the North American church. I think too many of us want Jesus to perform for us. Can you, can you do this? Can you make this work? But we don't see it as anything more than perform. So here he is, he says, perform. And Jesus, he begins to ask Jesus questions. They begin, to, they begin to question him and begin to make fun of him and mock him. And the scripture says that Jesus remains silent. So finally, Herod puts a robe on him and sends him back over to Pilate. And we catch up in verse 13. Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the people. And he said to them, you brought this man before me as one who corrupts and incites the people to rebellion after examining him before you. I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. No, nor does Herod, for he sent him back to us. And indeed, he has done nothing to deserve this death. Therefore, I will punish him. I'll teach him a lesson and I'll release him. And the crowds went nuts. No, no, crucify him, crucify him. So Pilate in verse 20 addresses again, let, wanting to release Jesus and they kept shouting out, crucify him. So a third time he said to them, why? What wrong has he done? I have found no guilt, no crime, no offense in him demanding death. And he just pleaded with the crowds and the crowds got louder and louder, much like the kid laying on the ground begging for Legos. So Pilate, much like the mama, said, fine, whatever. Let Barabbas go. We'll, we'll kill Jesus. Now I want you to think about this for a second. Jesus, innocent. Barabbas, not. And scripture, in scripture, in history, there is no narrative, no historical evidence of what happened to Barabbas after that. Now, there is this movie on Netflix. I'm not encouraging you to go watch it. 
because you'll never get that hour and 15 minutes of your life back. It's about Barabbas, and it's the whole idea that he had this major awesome encounter with God, and he became this revolutionary like evangelist. That would be super cool, but it's not historical, so we don't know, right? But we don't know if he turned back and looked at Jesus and thought, wow, why is this happening? We don't know if he went on and continued committing the horrible crimes he did. We don't know if he let that short but huge encounter with the Messiah change his life for forever. And I think the hardest part for me is not just that Barabbas got away and Jesus didn't. I think the hardest part for me and I think what the hardest part for all of us should be is that Jesus remained silent. He just stood there. And I know if it was me and I was trying to defend myself, I would turn into a used car salesman faster than you could say Bob's your uncle and I'd start telling you about all the things that I'd done right. But he didn't. He just stood there. He didn't say, hey, remember that dead boy that I raised back to life? Remember the deaf ears that I opened? Remember the blind eyes that now see? Remember the hundreds and thousands of people, the 5,000 men, their wives, their children that were hungry that I fed? Do you remember the times that I met you in your need and I touched your need and your life was changed? He said nothing. And I always wonder why. Like, why would they choose Barabbas? But why would they not remember what Jesus did? Why would Jesus stay silent? Why didn't he speak? And I thought about it. And it brings me to my second point. A hard one, but a good one, okay? In life, in a life full of corruption and sin, God is mercy. A.W. Tozer said it best, mercy is not something God has, but something God is. Jesus didn't need to speak. He knew what he was there for. He knew he had nothing to defend. That very moment was what he came to the earth for. So when he stood there silently, you've heard the term, silence speaks, you know, silence speaks louder than words. He said a lot, take Barabbas, let him go, let him get a chance. This is why I'm here. Judah Smith spoke about this and I just, you just can't outdo this. He says, for Jesus knew that the father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Barabbas thought it was the people that set him free. Mm -mm. It was the love of God. It was the love of a heavenly father that said, look, you're a mess. And I think this is the moment where we all have to really look at ourselves and go, wait a minute, I'm Barabbas. You are Barabbas. It wasn't just Barabbas represented on that platform that day. It was you. It was me. And maybe we don't have a rap sheet like he does. But we all, and hear me on this, whether you're sitting watching online or you're sitting in this sanctuary, every single one of us has junk. We do. Every pastor on staff, every person that's alive, we've got junk. Maybe it's anger, lies, infidelity. Dark secrets, cheating the system, justified theft, the way we treat other people, hate, prejudice, self-righteousness. The list goes on and on. And you know what's crazy? Is Jesus never said, I'll do it if they do this. He never died. He never died for you and me knowing what would happen. He did it in hopes that we would accept him. He did it in hopes that Barabbas would find the truth. And some of you in here, you need to realize that, man, Jesus died for you. He did. He didn't just die for people. He died for you. But then there's others in here that you need to recognize that maybe you love Jesus. Maybe you've given your life to Jesus, but you're like, yeah, I've given my life to Christ. But there's this stuff 
in my life that I got to work out. And when I get it worked out, I'll do what God's called me to do. And I'm here to tell you, I don't mean to bust your bubble, but you can't. You don't have what it takes. I don't care how strong you are. Cowboy, I don't care how many bulls you've wrestled in the ground and do whatever you do to those bulls. You are not strong enough. You don't have what it takes. You don't have the power. You don't have the skill. You will fail time and time and time again as long as you're trying to fix yourself yourself. You don't have what it takes. You can oppress it and hope it goes away. You can justify that everyone has secrets and issues and hope that it just gets better. But Jesus didn't stand on the platform that day just for your salvation. He stood on the platform that day for everything you've ever done, everything that you ever will do, every fear, every addiction, every heartache, every brokenness, every loneliness, every abandonment issue. He stood there for all those things so that you and I would not have to fix it ourselves. He is the only one that can fix it. He's the only one. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6 says, For there is only one God and only one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom, a substitutionary sacrifice to atone for all the testimony given at the right and a proper time. My third point and my absolute favorite point. He knows your name. Think about that for a second. How many of us have lived our life with a name that's been given to us by somebody else like, well, you're a mistake or you're a loser or you're gonna be just like your dad and mess everything up or you're a drunk or you're a failure or you're the problem child or you're a brat. I mean, we can can go through all these names and we start to believe these labels that are put on us. But I want you to hear me today, guys. If this is the only thing you get, get this. He knows your name. He sees your face. He knows the depths of your your heart. He knows the dreams. Because guess what? He put them there. He knows your heartache. He knows your fears. And he knows your name. Here's something super cool. I started researching this out. Barabbas, the name of his, his name has a meaning. Bar means son of Abba, or Bar means son of, and Abba means the father. Barabbas' name means son of the father. Okay, let me put that into perspective. That's, that's good stuff, and y'all are just looking at me. Let me say that one more time. Barabbas means son of the father. Jesus took Barabbas' place, so Barabbas had the opportunity to find his identity as the son of the father. Jesus took your place. He took my place so that we could be children of God. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what an incredible quality of love the Father has shown to us that we would be permitted to be named and called and counted the children of God. And so we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. I want to talk to you guys real quick about something. I think far too often, especially in the world we live in, we try to find our identity in what we can do. Well, I've accomplished this in ministry, or I've got this many degrees, or I've done this, or my wife is prettier than your wife, or what, you know, whatever. And we look for ways to prove that we have it, but at the end of the day, We have to stop and look and go, I only have what I have because of who God is. And he loves me at my darkest point as much as he loves me at my best point. So I want you to bow your heads all across this room. And maybe you're in here and you've never, you're like, yes, I, I am so Barabbas. I've never given my life to Christ. I didn't even, like, you hear about it, but it's not for just the masses, my friend. It's for you. And you're in here and you're like, I want, I need Jesus in my life. 
I need to give my life to him. I need to turn my life around. I need to recognize that what he paid for was so precious and so valuable. Today's your day. So if you're in here and you've never committed your life to Christ, I so want to pray with you. I want to ask that you just raise your hand. Anybody in here? Awesome. I see your hand, friend. We're going to keep your hand up. We're going to put a Bible in your hand. we got another one over here. Awesome. If your hand's raised, can you look up at me real quick? I want to pray with you. Can I pray with you? Can you come on down here? Can you come down here, buddy? You guys give him a hand. This is the best, most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Hey, this guy's got something for you right here. Awesome. This is your baby. That's important. Okay. So I want to just pray with you guys. This isn't a magical prayer. But the word says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, that you will be saved. And the most, the coolest thing about this is you don't have to do it alone. So I'm going to pray, but it's not about what I say. It's what you say. You repeat it. You believe it. And we as a church are going to pray for you because all these people have your back. Okay? You see that? All those people. You can grow up with a bunch of people who think you're pretty awesome. That's pretty cool, huh? Let's pray. Bow your heads with me. Just repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you right now recognizing the sin in our life. We ask that you forgive us of our sins. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you, Jesus, for choosing me. I ask that you forgive me Cleanse my heart, renew my mind, and Lord, help me to continue to follow after and pursue you. I give my life to you today. Today, my life changes. In your precious name, amen. Hey, welcome to the family of God. These awesome ladies over here want to pray with you if you'll go over here to them. Now I want to talk to all of you guys. See, because we all have junk. And I think sometimes we do try to fix it on our own. Well, man, I just, you know, I want to get involved at church, but there's this stuff. Listen, if you're here, every eye open, everybody looking around, and you're like, yeah, I love Jesus with my whole heart. But there's this thing. It might be a big, big thing. It might just be a little thing. But there's this thing. And you're like, I need to give it all to him. I need to let him take what he paid for and be free in the fullness of who he is. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. Go ahead. I'm standing. Yeah, if I'm the only one standing, that's fine. I'm the only one with issues. But and I want you to grab the hands of the people next to you. Because I'm going to tell you something. The hands of the people you're sitting next to, these are your family and friends. But this church is full of people who are doing life the way you're doing life. You do not have to do life alone. And when you're struggling, when you're walking through things, when marriage is hard, when finances aren't right, when you don't know what to do with your kids, don't try to figure it out by yourself. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for every man, woman, and child within the sound of my voice. Lord, I thank you that your word is clear that not one person in this room or watching online is a mistake. The Psalm said you intricately knitted us together in our mother's womb. God, I thank you that you have a plan and a purpose that far surpasses anything that we could even conjure up. And Lord, I pray for every person that has something that, man, it's just it. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's whatever. God, that they would just release that to you. Thank you, Lord, that we no longer have to listen to the lie the enemy tells us that we're this or we're that, but we can turn and say, no, we're a bought child of God. We are the head and not the tail. We are above and not beneath. We are blessed. We are called according to his purpose. Lord, I thank you for the call that you have on every man in this room as he leads his family, every woman in this room, every child in this room. God, I thank you that you've called us for such a time as this. Help us not to take that for granted. Help us to continue to seek you with every fiber of our being. And thank you, God, that you know our name. Thank you for choosing us in the midst of our inadequacies and imperfections. 
We give you glory for it in your precious name. Amen. We have prayer team up here. If you would like to have somebody pray with you, please don't hesitate. The rest of you love you. I hope you have the best week of your life.